Welcome to our weekly Parsha Insights. This week's Torah portion, entitled Va'era, has a hint in it relating to an event that we commemorate this week. This past week was the 24th day of the month of Tavis. Many years it occurs in the week in which we read last week's Parsha, as it happened this year, the Parsha of Shemos. And in many years it's in the Parsha of Ve'era. In fact, the Alter Rebbe, whose yard site is on the 24th day of Tavis, passed away Saturday night. So Saturday night connects to the week before as well as to the week after. So, the title of this week's Torah portion has a direct relationship hinted in the very name Va'era. Va'era has the letters of the word Ur, light, plus another letter Aleph, which is the initial of the word light. So you have two forms of light hinted in that word. The Alter Rebbe, the founder of the Chabad movement, whose yard site we observed in the 24th day of Tavis, about a week ago, almost a week ago, his name was Shnei'ar, which means two lights. And he was so named at the behest of the Baal Shem Tov, the spiritual grandfather of the Alter Rebbe, because he said and prophesied that the Alter Rebbe, Rabbi Shnei'ar Zalman, will illuminate the world in two ways, through the revealed parts of Torah. He wrote a modified, updated code of Jewish law, a definitive work on Jewish law, and also his writings of the Tanya and other Hasidic works that would illuminate the world with the spiritual light, the hidden light of Torah. And it makes sense that the word Va'era has both forms of light in it. It has the word R, light, spelled out fully, plus the letter Aleph, which is the initial of the word R, which means a hidden form of light. So you have the revealed and hidden form of light hinted in that word. <clears throat> One of the prominent features of the Parsha of this week's Torah portion is that it refers to the Exodus through four different expressions. And these four expressions that are mentioned in the Torah, the Hitzesi, I will take you out, Vagaalti, I will redeem you, Vihitzalti, I will save you, Vilakahti, I will take you. These four expressions are used by our sages to establish the requirement of drinking four cups of wine at the night of the Seder because there are four different expressions of redemption, and every cup of wine is a celebration of one of those forms of redemption. Now, we have to understand why there's a need for four expressions of redemption. Redemption was a one-time thing. The day they left Egypt on Passover was the day in which they were redeemed, the day they were liberated, the Exodus. So there should be one cup of wine celebrating. And if the celebration was so great, make the cup of wine bigger. Why why divide it into four? So commentators point out that there were actually four stages (coughs) in the Exodus. Stage number one, the Jews in Egypt were not just prisoners, slaves, but they were tortured. They were not just beaten mercilessly if they didn't produce the right amount of bricks, but they were also murdered. Babies were crushed into the mortar if they didn't make as much mortar as they needed for the bricks. Babies were slaughtered and Pharaoh bathed in their blood, as our sages tell us. That when the Torah says in last week's portion that Pharaoh died and the cries of the Jewish people became stronger, It doesn't mean that he literally died. It means that he became leprous 
requiring, as his doctors, his wise men told him, bathing in blood for which he slaughtered Jewish babies. This was, and many other forms of brutal torture. So the first thing that happened, the first stage of redemption, was a half year before Passover. In fact, it was on Rosh Hashanah of that year that the slave labor ceased. The Jews were no longer subjected to this torturous slave labor. But they were still slaves. They still were the property, the chattel of the Egyptians. Well, that happened, that ceased when they were liberated from Egypt. They were no longer slaves. You can be a slave and be treated in a way that doesn't cause you to suffer physical harm uh, and degradation. You could just be the property and you have to follow the bidding of your master. That's a more benign form of slavery. It's still slavery, but it's a benign form. They were released from that as well. But they were still prisoners in Egypt. No Jew, no person could leave Egypt without the permission of the authorities. It's much like the Soviet Union before its collapse. And that was re remedied with the exodus on the day of Passover. But they were still spiritual slaves because they still had the exposure to Egyptian culture, and according to our sages, they had sunk very low to the 49th level of impurity, 49 out of 50. They were just short one level of being lost forever. And as they left Egypt, they counted 49 days, and the 50th day they, gave, they received the Torah, which is the way God took us to be his nation, and that represented spiritual liberation. So there were actually four different stages of redemption, not just one exodus. They were first freed from torturous slave labor. They were then freed from slavery. They were then free from being in the Egyptian prison. And then they were spiritually free from Egyptian values and mores and taken by God to be his people, to be his nation. So that explains the four expressions of redemption, corresponding to which we drink four cups of wine, so that we're celebrating each and every stage of that process of redemption. The Rebbe's father, Rebbe Levi Yitzchak, says something very interesting, that the four expressions correspond to the four holidays that Jews celebrate, four biblical holidays. The four biblical holidays are Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We count that as one holiday because it's one continuum. Then you have Sukkot, Sukkot. Then you have Pesach, Passover, and Shavuos, the anniversary of the giving of the Torah. One of the, the first expression, one of the expressions is Vehotzesi. I will take you out of the torturous labor of Egypt. That's Rosh Hashanah. That's when it happened. The other expression, V'ga'alti, I will liberate you. That happened in Pesach. V'hitzalti, the Hebrew word, hitzalti, is translated, I will save you. But the root of the word is tzel. Tzel is shade. That alludes to the holiday of Sukkot, in which God protected us by keeping us in his shade, that we were protected by God. So this gives a little bit of another version of the four stages of redemption because it's, it's referring to the way we were sur we survived in the desert because if we hadn't been protected in the desert the exodus from Egypt would have not been worth anything because we would have perished so that's another one of the four another way another version of one of the four stages so you have Rosh Hashanah the Hotsesia will take you out of the slave labor Pesach is Viga'alti, I will liberate you. That's when the actual liberation happened. Vitsalti, I will save you. That refers to Sukkot, when we were saved from the elements. And the Hebrew word sail, shade, is hinted in that word. And Volokachti, I will take you as a nation. That refers to Shavuos. That's when we received the Torah. But then the Rebbe's father added, there's a fifth expression, really. The fifth expression is Vehevesi, I will bring you to the promised land. So why don't we drink a fifth cup? So there's actually opinion of the Talmud that we should drink a fifth cup, but the custom is not to drink it. The fifth cup 
refers to the future, the coming of Mashiach, when we will all be brought back to the land of Israel. So that's the simple explanation of the fifth expression, Vehevesi. But Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, the Rebbe's father, says in the word Vehevesi, you have the word of, the month of of, and the letter Tav, which is stands for Tisha, the ninth day of of. But the fifth expression refers to Tisha B'av. Now, how does that make sense? Tisha B'av is the saddest day of the year. It's not a day of liberation. But the answer to that is that, on the contrary, when Mashiach comes, Tisha B'av will not just no longer be a day of sadness, of mourning, of grieving, of, of fasting. It'll become a day of celebration and feasting. It'll be the greatest Jewish holiday, more joyous than all the other holidays. And that's why that fifth expression alludes to the future that's represented by Tisha B'Av that we observe even today. But even though we observe it today until in the past, because for the future we pray and hope and anticipate we will be liberated and be in the age of Mashiach, but in the past Tisha B'Av was a day of sadness, yet it was referred to in the Book of Lamentations as a moed, as a festival, because it has the potential to be the most joyous day. Moreover, the Talmud, the Jerusalem Talmud, says that the soul of Mashiach was born, came into this world on Tisha B'av. You see, the Talmud makes a very strong argument, and this is something that many people are not aware of, that there is a Mashiach in every generation. There's a, someone who is worthy of being Mashiach, that if the generation is worthy, that person will be commissioned with a job to liberate the Jewish people from exile and bring about the Messianic age. So the Talmud says that at the time that the temple was destroyed, a prescient Arab, an Arab who had prophetic abilities, who was a neighbor of a Jew who had a cow, and the cow mooed in some way, some fashion, and the prescient Arab says to the Jewish neighbor, your temple has just been destroyed. And then the cow made a similar sound a second time, and the Arab tells the Jew, your Mashiach has been born. That means from the very beginning of the de- exile, at the time of the destruction, which brought us, which happened on Tisha B'av, the soul of Mashiach came into this world. So every Tisha B'av, we not only celebrate the potential for the temple to be rebuilt, we also observe the birthday of Mashiach. When Moses and Aaron come to the people and tell them about the fact that God is going to redeem them, it says, V'lei Shomuel Moshe, they didn't listen to Moses. Why? Because they had short spirit and hard labor. And the question is asked, God promised Moses that they will listen. Moses had demonstrated miracles to them, and it says they listened to Moses, they believed in Moses. And yet over here, the Torah says that things changed and they no longer believed, or they didn't even listen to Moshe. And the answer is, based on Maimonides, that there are two kinds of emunah, two kinds of faith. There's faith based on miracles. If someone, a righteous person, comes to you and performs miracles heals a person from a terminal illness that the doctors gave up and gives you a brach, a blessing, and the next checkup, the doctors say it's gone, and the person lives another 30 years. Miracles like that happen. And when a person sees those miracles, it causes them to start believing, even if they hadn't believed before. They believe in God and God's power to heal, among other powers that God has. That's one kind of faith. But the problem with that kind of faith is that if the tables are turned and situations are reversed, a person will lose that faith. Yes, when Moses came to show the Jewish people miracles, God gave him to show the people the miracle of the staff turning into a snake and turning back into a staff, the miracle of how Moses' hand became leprous. Yes, the water turning into blood. They were impressed. And they believed that Moses had come to liberate them. 
But when things reversed and Moses' attempt to get them liberated seemed to have failed and Pharaoh made the life more miserable for them, now they had to collect straw and in addition to producing the bricks, which we read in last week's Torah portion, the miracles that they saw before, with all due respect, no longer held sway. And they now couldn't listen to Moses. The faith was weakened because the faith was based on a miracle. It was not based on their own experience. What happened at Mount Sinai was something qualitatively different from any other kind of faith, as Maimonides emphasizes. What happened at Mount Sinai is the people themselves witnessed godly revelation. It was they, they, they heard God's voice uttering the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Statements, to be more accurate. This is not something that they heard from others, that they saw hints of through miracles. A nenu ro'o, our eyes saw, Zar, and not some stranger telling us a story. We heard it, we saw it with our own eyes, we heard it with our own ears. That kind of faith, where you experience something firsthand, that kind of faith will never waver, will never wane. And that's what God meant when he said that the people will believe, he was referring to when the Torah will be given. When the Torah will be given, that will fundamentally change the way the Jewish people relate to God and relate to God's revelation to us. When the Torah talks about Moses and Aaron, sometimes it has Moses' name before Aaron. Moses was the leader. Sometimes it'll have Aaron's name before Moses. Aaron was older. But Rashi says the Torah does that deliberately to tell us that they were both equal. Yes, they were both equal because they both contributed to the same goal in different ways. And this is how the Zohar explains the difference between Moses and Aaron. Moses is called Shushvina de Malka, the escort of the king. Aaron was called Shushvina de Matronisa, the escort of the queen. What they, the Zohar was referring to is that Moses and Aaron's goal was the same, to bring God and the Jewish people together. It's like in a marriage. You have the groom and you have the bride. And they're both from different families, different parents, obviously. And the parents escort the groom and escort the bride to one another. Moses was the one who escorted God. He was the one who introduced God to the people. He's the escort of the king. Aaron was the representative of the people. He was the escort of the queen, of the bride. He brought the Jewish people closer to God. So, in a certain sense, they were both equal because they both made it possible for this union of God and the Jewish people, albeit from different directions. And that's why they were both needed, because if you try to bring God down from up on high, there's always a chance that you will not be able to relate down here. When you're down here and someone reveals something supernatural, something of sublime, something spiritual, you're not ready to absorb it because you're so ensconced, you're so attached to the material world. On the other hand, if someone takes you and tries to lift you up and elevate you, that'll make you more spiritual and elevate you, but you have limits how far you can go. To go from the bottom to all the way to the top is something is a formidable challenge. Therefore, you needed Moses and Aaron to come together. Moses bringing God down to the people. He brought the tablets down for, on Mount Sinai. He brought the Torah to the people. He was God's representative. And Aaron was the one who brought the people through his connection to the people, through his love for the people, through his dedication to the people. That's why... When the Torah tells us that Moses died, it says the people grieved and mourned him. When it says that Aaron died, it says everyone grieved him. What do you mean everyone? Moses was not necessarily that popular amongst many of the people because he was a stern, rigid leader. And he told them what he had to tell them that they didn't always appreciate. 
On the other hand, Aaron was a man who was of the people. He was always bringing peace. He would bring peace between husband and wife. He would bring peace between one person and another. He endeared himself to all of the people. And that's why when he passed away, everyone mourned him. The men and the women, nobody felt that Aaron had ever done anything to hurt them. Moses, on the other hand, was not as popular, although he was revered and he was grieved and mourned when he passed away, but nevertheless, it wasn't as universal as it was with Aaron, because Aaron was the one of the brought the people close to God, and Moses brought God down to the people and imposed God's will on the people, which is not always that comfortable and that appealing and that appreciated. This Parsha also goes into seven of the ten plagues. Seven of the ten plagues. What is the significance of ten plagues? God didn't need to have ten plagues to get Pharaoh to let the Jews go. So what someone will say, well, he didn't need ten plagues to get Pharaoh to let the Jews go, but he had to punish Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So he punished them through ten plagues. But that also doesn't fully explain why the need for ten. God could have given them a punishment in one in one gesture that would have incorporated ten different forms of pain and suffering. Why did it have to go in ten separate ways? So the Hasidic answer to this question is that when God created the world... And that means that God created a f substance, a physical existence that is material and physical and subject to natural laws that has the state of concealment in it. As I mentioned many times, that the Hebrew word for world, olam, the root of that word means concealment. When God created the world with his ten utterances, these were ten instruments in which God's energy was creative and also concealing. God created the world, but he hid in his creation. You don't see God's presence just by opening your eyes and opening your ears. You have to study. You have to be, receive the tradition. You have to meditate on it. But the world in and of itself conceals God's presence in spite of the fact that God's presence is what creates and animates the world. Well, that had to be transformed into ten statements, ten commandments. Those ten commandments, those ten statements, are the reversal of the ten utterances. The ten utterances represent God in a concealed state. The ten statements are representative of God in a revealed state. In order to transform the ten utterances into ten statements, ten utterances of concealment, into ten statements of revelation, you needed the ten plagues. They weakened. It's, they were not just directed against Egypt and the Egyptians and a punishment for their evil. That it was. But it was also a way of breaking, breaking the crust that covered up the divine energy that exists in everything. And when that happened, the world was ready for the ten statements, the revelation of godliness, instead of the concealment of godliness. The first of the ten plagues is dam, is blood. So let's ex explain what the purpose of this plague was. Because the ten plagues, in addition to being the instruments through which God weakened the physical, obstructive nature of the world, in addition to being a punishment for the Egyptians, it was also a way of demonstrating, it was an educational process, it was a way of demonstrating to the Egyptians and to the Israelites and to the whole world that God is in total control. And that means that there is only one God. God is exclusive. How do you demonstrate God is exclusive? Because if you prove God's power, people will say, yes, God is one of the many gods. This is exactly what Pharaoh uh, said. When Moses approached Pharaoh, the Midrash tells us and tells him, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may serve me. M M Pharaoh had a directory. We don't have telephone directories anymore, but he had a directory of all the idols in the world. 
the, the idols that the Egyptians worshipped and the idols that others worshipped. You wanted to know exactly what others worshipped as well. And he looked up the Hebrew name, the Hebrew God, and he says, no, nope, it's not in my book. I'm not familiar with it. So if he would have been convinced that there is a God of Israel, that wouldn't have negated the other gods, and he would have still considered himself or his deity to be a, a deity, one of men among many others. You you introduce me to a new one? Okay, welcome to the club. So the first thing that God does is to destroy the primary idol of that country before he punishes the people, which means that when in the educational process, before you prove the greatness of God, you have to first prove his exclusivity, negating the other possible gods. One of the gods of Egypt was the Nile River, and it was more than just a god that people worship believing that it had power, but it actually does have power. The Nile River was the source of the entire economy of Egypt. If the Nile River did not overflow and irrigate the whole land, people would starve to death. So the Nile was the source, and they deified it and glorified it as the source of all of their economic well-being. And that Nile turned into blood, which is God's way of saying, it's useless. If I don't allow the Nile River to produce the effects that it has, it has in producing a fertile agricultural system, if I don't make it happen, the Nile is worthless. So the first plague actually demonstrated the futility of worshipping the Nile. It's not the Nile that gives you water and food. It's God who does it, and the Nile cannot be worshipped. The Nile is no, lo- no more than an instrument. Just like an instrument could build a building, you have a hammer and a carpenter builds a beautiful bookcase with a hammer, No one is going to praise the hammer and say, Hammer, you're great, you're wonderful, I I like you. Although nowadays people will say, I love things that are inanimate. In Jewish tradition, love has to be applied only to real things, real things that, that 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 are sentient beings, God and even other human beings. You love, you don't love an instrument, but putting that aside, the hammer is only an instrument. The sun and the moon are only instruments, and they shouldn't be glorified. And certainly the Nile, God demonstrated through the first plague, is not a deity and should not be glorified. So then what's the second plague? The plague of frogs. Frogs came out of the Nile. So Rashi says, again, that's in order to destroy the belief that the Nile is a deity. The Nile is not God. It's because the Nile produced such disgusting creatures as frogs that entered every part, every nook and cranny of their homes. When a person opened his mouth, a frog jumped in, our sages tell us. They went everywhere, and they just nauseated everyone. So the question that I have is, if God already demonstrated through the first plague that there is no reason to worship the Nile, their God, because it turned into blood, which couldn't, which would not be good for for anything. Why did he need a second plague of frogs to demonstrate the same thing? So one simple answer is, when you do something once, you take it. Eh, it was a coincidence. It doesn't mean anything, but when it happens twice, that means that God means business. That this is not a coincidence. This is not a happenstance. This is real that the Nile is worthless. But I'd like to share another explanation as well, that there are two ways that you have to discredit a false belief. One way is through intellectual argumentation, through intellectual and logical proof. But logical proof alone is not enough to dismiss a person's attachment to a false belief and a false idea. Because, as we know this, and even in science, that even after scientists come to prove a certain or disprove a certain uh, belief in medicine, and it's proven without a shadow of a doubt that this medication does not work, 
or this treatment does not work. Nevertheless, people, including doctors, will keep on promoting the outdated and rejected science, and it takes years, sometimes decades, and a generation for everyone to turn around and accept the truth. We're, we're, I think we're seeing that even today with regard to COVID and so on. But it's not enough to prove something logically to get people to turn away from their beliefs. When the Nile River turned into blood, that was a logical argument. Blood doesn't produce the same results as water in terms of irrigating the crops. And therefore, and therefore, it makes no sense to worship the Nile. But that did not mean that people's feelings for the Nile would be affected and that they would no longer have those feelings for the Nile. Their belief in the Nile River was not based just on logic, faulty logic, but logic. It was based on emotions because they became attached to it. You could ha know that a certain animal is harmful to you, but you become attached to the animal emotionally and you don't want to get rid of it. That's why the second plague, where the Nile produced these disgusting frogs that really nauseated the people, besides the other nuisances that the frogs represented, that took the people, detached them emotionally from the Nile River. And this is a lesson for us that it's important that when we come to distancing ourselves from false ideas and especially evil ideas, we have to work on two fronts, on the intellectual front and on the emotional front. And then we get to the third plague, the plague of kinim, of lice. What was unique about this plague? It's the first plague where Pharaoh's wise men, magicians, sorcerers, whatever, said, Etzba Lekimhi, this is the finger of God. They, they, the first time they recognized that God has power that they couldn't replicate. They could replicate, Rashi tells us, the plague of blood. They can take water and turn it into blood. They had that power. They can take the water and turn it into a source of frogs. But they couldn't replicate the plague of lice. Why not? So Rashi quotes our sages that magic powers require something to be larger than a barley bean. And lice are tiny, and therefore magic has no power to replicate them. <clears throat> what does that teach us? In every area of life, we go by quantity. We are affected, we are influenced, we are brainwashed when we see things that are big. And when we see things that are so much bigger than us, it makes us feel small. You often hear astronomers talking about how vast the universe is and how tiny, what a speck of dust, and not even a speck of dust the earth is, and how insignificant we are. That's the wrong approach. Judaism does not accept that approach. Yes, we are a speck of dust in the Milky Way, which is a speck of dust in the universe, but we are the most important speck of dust that has more value than the whole universe. Why? Because we were created by God with a special mission that no other planet and no other creature, even if there is life, intelligent life in other parts of the universe, which is quite possible according to the Torah, they were not created with a mission that we were created. They don't have this power to transform the whole universe into a divine palace for God by virtue of our making the right choices, doing the right things, doing mitzvahs, and so on. Only we were chosen for that pur purpose. The earth was chosen to be the location upon which this drama would unfold, the drama of bringing God's plan of creation to the whole universe. It, this is the stage in which this, this drama is engaged in. And 
we are therefore the center of the universe. We're the tiny speck of dust, but we are the we are the center of the universe. I'm not talking about spatially. I don't even think there's a concept of center of the universe, if that even exists in, in astronomy. But we are the center of the universe, and within ourselves, the the land of Israel is the center of the center, and within Israel is Jerusalem, which is the center of the center of the center. Within Jerusalem it's the Beis Hamikdash, the holy temple, and within the Beis Hamikdash it's the holy of holies. Within the holy of holies it's the ark, and within the ark it's the tablets. That's the core of the whole universe. It's a tiny, not even a speck of a speck of a speck of a speck, but it's the most important thing. In Judaism, nothing is considered valuable because of its size. It's 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 about the quality, and the, and the, that's the idea that in, in the secular world, in the world of magic, because the secular world in its entirety is magic. It seems to have power, but it doesn't really have its own power. It's, it's all power. Its power comes from God's energy, but it 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 feigns. It acts as if it has power. And in that realm of the world of science and the world of logic, the world of philosophy, the world of theology, small doesn't rate, doesn't, isn't important. Only big is important. Small things shouldn't be, shouldn't be, we shouldn't care about small things. But then the Torah tells us, but in Judaism, in spirituality, in God's world, small is big. And people who ask, why would God care about us little puny human beings doing one mitzvah here, one mitzvah there? What value does it have to an infinite God? And the answer is, to an infinite God, volume doesn't mean anything. Big is not big, and small is not small. God chooses for small to be valuable. It has more value than the whole universe. One person doing one mitzvah one time has more power and energy than the whole universe. The whole universe is like a speck of dust relative to a Jew who follows the Torah. And that's what the third plague demonstrated, that God's world of spirituality, in that world, small rates. In the world of secularism, small doesn't have any power. So that's one of the lessons. Then we get to the next plague, Arov, the mixture of wild animals. This is the first time the Torah says that there was a distinction between the animals of the Jews and the homes of the Jews that were not attacked by these wild animals and of the Egyptians. What about the plague of blood? What about the plague of frogs? What about the plague of lice? It doesn't say that it didn't affect the Israelites. It doesn't say that. So some opinions say that it did affect the Israelites even though it was intended to punish the Egyptians, it was there to show them God's power. And some say, no, it didn't affect the Israelites, but then it's not mentioned in any other of the plagues until the fourth plague. So the fourth plague was unique in that it demonstrated, number one, that God is the only God, intellectually and emotionally, that God has the power that the magicians, the secular forces don't have that power, that God's power is unique. But now it was to demonstrate that God has a unique relationship with the Jewish people. Because this is the first plague in which is underscored the idea that the plague only affected the Egyptians and not the Israelites. That God has a special relationship with us. And on that note, I'd like to conclude that God should help that that special relationship which Moses enunciated when he said and quoted God that the Jewish people are b'ni b'chori Yisrael, my firstborn Israel. We are God's firstborn, as it were. We are all God's children, but we are God's firstborn. And we should awaken that merit in us and beseech God to take us out of exile, bring us the final redemption through Mashiach, that will bring an end to the war in Israel and bring an end to the evil in the world. And may we see the ten plagues reenacted without having to cause anyone to suffer. But the educational aspects of the ten plagues should be revealed again and take away from the concealment that the world suffers from, in which a world of concealment allows for all sorts of evil. May that take place imminently.